This presentation will provide an analysis of my coaching experience, coupled with that of my significant other, finishing with my future development for coaching. The drill I composed consisted of two five-a-side teams that were placed in a small grid, which ensured the players were figuring out how to make and find space while keeping possession in order to score tries, which is a key factor in rugby. The drill was blocked into three times three minute games with a one minute break in between and was aimed at fostering the athlete's understanding of tactical gameplay. Although not the same drill as mine, this clip shows its similarities. The aim of this small sided game is to keep possession and score tries by maintaining low Claudia positions into contact, with one player going over in a nice low position and then playing the ball away into space. As you can see here, a nice low ball carry with a player low and early over the ball and they play the ball away so they get to keep the ball. Again, this player is in too slowly, so it's a turnover and the other team get to attack. This quick turnover play creates a dynamic and quick thinking game. Again, the player runs out into touch there, so it's a turnover. Throughout my coaching experience, I try to guarantee a rich learning environment by employing a non-linear pedagogical approach by virtue of game sense training. Game sense training is a prime example of non-linear pedagogy. It is used throughout the world in elite level team sports and is especially popular within rugby union. Like 2004 referred to game sense as any coaching approaches that are game based and employ questioning to stimulate thinking rather than telling players what to do. Competitive team sports are an unstable environment in which unpredictability and ambiguity for players and coaches. Therefore, I wanted to put an emphasis on preparing the players for uncertainties rather than the in inevitable in match situations. As such, traditional training methods such as deliberate practice are not sufficient enough to prepare the players for the non-linear characteristics of the game. Lebed 2006, Eriksson et al, 1993. Allen and Hodge 2006 focused on the motivational climate provided by coaches. They suggested a coach should create a learning environment that stimulates skill development and an athlete's psychosocial competencies. This, ho this holistic approach allows athletes to foster a sense of autonomy and relatedness, resulting in an increased motivation. Magu and Veleran 2007. By adopting game sense approach, it enabled me to produce a motivational climate by employing, by, by employing fundament, fundamental features. For example, employing competitive and decision-making games to shape understanding of when to make specific decisions in relation to the opposition. And secondly, the coach questions technique, tactics and strategy to stimulate the player's yeah, intellectual engagement. As can, as can be seen from the clip, there are multiple turnovers within just 30 seconds. And therefore, at the end of the set, I'll be questioning as to why this is happening rather than giving them a direct solution. Through employing a game sense approach, a social constructivist approach to learning was also upheld. Malone 2003 theorised constructivism as Learning is a process by which people make sense of the environment and personal history. The acquisition of new knowledge is affected and shaped by prior knowledge, interaction with others, experience and inherited predispositions. Our ability to learn is also influenced by logic, emotion, intuition and motivation. Social constructivist approaches are utilised to encourage learning through engaging in collective problem solving experiences with peers and enrich, holistic, well, em enrich learning holistically while emphasising their individual and social growth. Azarito and Ennis 2003. This encourages the athletes to adapt, make decisions and find solutions. To achieve this, as previously mentioned, I gather the teams at the end of each set and will use active questioning to help them source solutions to the problems faced by the opposition. The social concept enables altered perceptions of each player to be portrayed in order to find the best solution, therefore facilitating the learning process. I decided to take a non-linear pedagogy as this has been supported by many researchers such as Vygotsi, who paved the way for social learning. Vincent et al, 2016, Lava Wenger, 1991, Vygotsi, 1978. Furthermore, contemporary literature has highlighted the significance of promoting performance decision-making to achieve optimal learning. Light et al, 2014, Maxwell, 2006, Ovens and Smith, 2006. During my coaching experience, although I, prescribed, um, although I prescribed a session consisting of the aforementioned approaches, I noticed in some players that the motivation level started to drop. Reflecting back, this may have been due to the mixability of players. The least experienced and talented players were often ones experienced a loss of motivation. Therefore, they may have benefited from more directional learning through integrating the behaviourist and cognitivist approaches. Although I allowed for conversation at the end Although I allowed for conversation at the end of each set to facilitate learning, it was my first session with the team. Therefore, as I didn't have a significant relationship with the players, 
it may have resulted in it may have resulted in athletes not feeling as confident to reject their feelings and that's causing a, lo- a lack of motivation fundamentally modern literature I wanted to step away from my coaching habits that I've learned throughout my playing career and utilise contemporary literature to teach. However, it seems a balance between linear and non-linear pedagogy is essential to maintain the motivation and performance of athletes. I have been informed through analysing myself and my significant other that it is key to account for individuality, especially when working with players of mixed ability due to novice players commonly needing more linear pedagogy. Therefore, to continue to develop my coaching and continue to close the practice gap, I'll consider the use of both linear and non-linear pedagogy to account for individuality. Essentially, the concept of sports coaching, as with any social phenomenon, is shaped by social structures, trends and relationships, and thus it remains constantly fluid. Lyle 2005. Dabowski 2006 identified seven core capabilities of effective coaching. They are rapport building, deep listening, creative questioning, giving effective feedback, clear goal setting, intuition and presence. To build rapport, a key factor is voice qualities. For example, tone, speed and timbre of voice are essential. Sometimes I found myself to be quite direct and monotone when coaching, therefore adding this aspect can be crucial for athlete learning. Deep listening is also imperative as listening to and adapting to what the athletes have to say not only facilitates their learning through social interaction, but also the coaches can gather their first-hand experiences of playing. There's no, there's no substitute for being out there on the pitch. Creative questioning enables the athletes to think of new concepts that are used to find solutions. I attempted this in my coaching session by using, by using active questioning, and I will continue to do so in the future. Furthermore, giving feedback is essential to maintain the motivation of the athletes while giving the athletes advice on how to improve. A key part of this is during, during the session, something I undoubtedly need to work on rather than just re- uh, relying on video analysis after the session ends. Leaning on from feedback, goal setting is crucial. Performance goals in rugby are key for enhancing task-specific task on-field behaviour for the athletes. Having the ability to set each player effective goals before a game enables the players to push themselves to achieve their goals and ultimately attain optimal performance across the whole squad. Intuition is rarely spoken of, yet it is used by almost every elite coach. The unstable and complex environment of sports makes the use of intuition an important component of expert coaching. St. Pierre and Smith, 2014. Especially in rugby, my use of intuition will be key due to the ever-changing environment that presents itself in every game. Therefore, the ability to use intuition and adapt to the game plan, if necessary, is vital. Finally, a factor I think comes naturally to me is presence. This can be linked with the coach-athlete relationship as it's the ability to employ a style that is flexible, open and confident, which allows the athlete to explore himself more more deeply, which may be fundamental to their development. As my presence of coaching continues to advance, my habitus will develop in such a way my coaching style will become more natural and shaped without any rational consideration. Dombowski, 2006. Thus, the seven factors I propose by Dombowski will be less rational, making myself a more fluid and improved coach. To summarise, research favours non-linear pedagogy, such as the game sense approach and the social constructivist approach to learning. However, the comparison of coaching between myself and my significant other reveals there can be no singular entity within coaching to facilitate athletic performance and attain successful results, especially due to the highly subjective nature of coaching. Furthermore, by identifying Dombowski's seven core um, core capabilities of effective coaching, it is shown to me coaching isn't all about the methods employed, rather it's about how you employ them. Further supported by Hunashek, 1992, who proposed being assigned to an effective versus ineffective teacher can highly alter the student's achievement, achievement gains. Thus, the impact of having a series of effective or ineffective teachers can produce great variability in a student achievement in a rel- relatively short time. Hanashek, 1992, Sunglis Wright and Horn, 1997. As such, the methods of learning employed by the coach can be seen as irrelevant if they aren't projected in the right manner. Fisher agrees non-linear approaches to pedagogy are a considerable facilitator of performance. Coat et al. 2007, Berry et al. 2008. As such, the approaches I employed of game sense and social constructivism were done so in accordance with the literature that advocates such methods. 
However, my significant other applies a behaviourist approach to learning. Although I'm describing the approaches employed by my coach, it should be noted behaviourism is considered to be a theory of learning and not a theory of teaching. Indeed, coaching is a methodology, methodology not an ideology. Fosnott Perry, 1996. O'Connor and Lags, 2009. Watson, 1919, was the first propo- uh, proponent of behaviourism. However, Pavlov is perhaps the most renowned researcher by his study that explores conditioning through the use of a dog. Coaches who employ behaviourist methods are a transmitter of knowledge that consists of highly structured, one-dimensional training sessions. Often my coach would give us a fixed outcome of what we had to achieve in certain situations during fixed gameplay. This would then be greeted with positive or negative reinforcement depending on if we achieve the outcome or not. An example drill my significant other often prepared would be making us consistently go through exit strategies in certain parts of the pitch. And if we didn't perform the outcomes correctly, we'd be punished at the end of the session. The drills are repetitive and tedious, but as reinforcement becomes more apparent, mistakes are lessened, creating a consistent outcome. The use of positive and negative reinforcement to achieve a desired outcome can be referred to as operant conditioning. Although not highly motivating, a behaviourist approach enables players to all be on the same page when it comes to the natural setting of exiting in a match, and everyone is operating functionally in their role. Furthermore, at times, a game plan must be stuck to during a must-win game. Therefore, the the behaviourist approach enables a fixed plan from the coach that can easily be followed by all players. Conversely, this may be detrimental due to the ever-changing environment in gameplay as a more linear coaching may not prepare the players for the unpredictability of gameplay. Bassos et al, 2008. As aforementioned, I described the non-existence of the coach-athlete relationship when I was coaching. Olympio et al, 2008, described the importance of the coach-athlete relationship for the coachee to efficiently learn. This is what I found my coach to be exceptional at, resulting in the team listening and respecting him at all times. Consequently, he was able to foster athletes through the behaviourist approach due to the players simply not wanting to let him, let, let him or each other down. Although he created an environment in which the coach-athlete relationship was strong, the players would still have no impact on the training sessions. Light and Willie in 2008 proposed the coach should have the athletes, should provide the athletes with a social, um, should provide the athletes with a supportive social environment in which they feel confident to be creative, develop ideas and see if they work. The coach's main focus should be on, provided, on providing an appropriate learning environment, social and physical. Partly agreeing with Light and William, my significant other provided an appropriate learning environment. However, at no point did any players put forward ideas for training or gameplay. This can therefore be considered an inhibitor performance and a big work on for my coach.